All right, it's that time of week. Mike Latua breaking down Illinois basketball and maybe the win of the year. Um, I, I think this is maybe the most convincing win. I think Illinois looked like a Big Ten title team in their 80-67 win over Wisconsin at the State Farm Center. Snowy, all of that, but I'm sure on TV, Mike Latua, it had to look good because the lower bowl was full, the 100 level was full, and uh, just a massive win. Most of it on the shoulders of, of National Player of the Year candidate, Big Ten Player of the Year candidate, Kofi Coburn, who outduels Johnny Davis. But got to give credit to Demonte Williams, Trent Frazier for the defense, Jacob Granson busts out of a slump. Just a massive, massive win. Like, what did you see in that team? Well, you mentioned the crowd first, and, and a lot of questions. How many are going to be there? Four, five, six, seven thousand, ten thousand. What it's what's it going to be? The Kofi dunk at the end. From my couch, you could have told me there were 15,000 people now. Really, I mean, it really, looked, it really looked that way. And I know those guys certainly appreciate it. I know when, when, when I was there, it's, it helps, man. It helps. And there's part of the reason why that there was almost a campaigning before the game to get people out there. It, it makes a big difference. But it was. It was the win of the year. Um, and just the way that they did it. I, I think Johnny Davis, a lot of credit goes to Demonte Williams. A lot of credit goes to – to Trent Frazier, but it really was by committee. We'll, we'll break it down in the film, but bumping cutters and not ever really making him feel comfortable. Robbie Hummel said it on the broadcast last night that Johnny Davis was just kind of missing shots and that he had open looks. Not really. Um, you know, a lot of the looks that he got, although, you know, he cleanly got them off, they were all contested for the most part. He had one downhill drive with his right hand in the second half. That was probably his easiest – look at the game but other than that they did they did such a good job of just staying disciplined and it looked like the game plan was this guy's not going to beat us uh you know we, we want to force these other guys to try to beat us in wisconsin you know I, when i did my top five teams in the big 10 that was my question is is this supporting cast on a night and i know johnny had <laughs> 22 and you know 22 and 15 um but he had to work for it uh he had to work really hard for it and Illinois has proven defensively that although they were bad defensively in the first half, that when they do lock in and the way that their defense is set up with, we don't, you know, we force tough threes because we're never in rotation. There were a couple of times where guys got beat baseline and rotation happened out of necessity, but really like this is a team that you just, you know, you want to see Curbelo kind of get back fully healthy and, can we see just the, the finished product, you know, and, and you hope that by the end of February, that's what you have going into March and they're on a great trajectory right now. You're sitting at the top of the big 10. Uh, I know this schedule continues to get a little tougher compared to some other teams that are at the top, but you take it one game at a time. And I, I think you stack up game by game. I know you look at the full slate, but you stack up game by game. I, it, it's hard to just think, yeah, you know, Illinois, you know, they can win. They can win every game. They can't if you take it one by one, but you know, it's just going to become come down to the game plan and discipline. And that's exactly what they did last night. It was a great game plan to execute. So many different angles we can go. I got to start with Kofi Coburn, 37 and 12, 16 of 19 from the field. Mike, uh, Wisconsin just had no answer. You said it, it was a bad matchup for Wisconsin with young bigs, a little thinner votes, a bigger guy, but just couldn't contend with, with an all American. Um, what did Kofi do so well and what translates from that against Trace Jackson Davis against, you know, Zach Eady and, and Purdue's big men, because we know Kofi can, can demolish teams like Northwestern and, and, and even Wisconsin with the bigs they have right now. I think those bigs are going to be good down the line, but just younger right now. And Kofi's just a, a man child. What translates moving forward? Yeah, I think there's a lot of teams in the big 10 and in college basketball that, you know, all things equal, sometimes it comes down to just making shots from the outside. And when you don't have that one night, like Wisconsin does, it's hard to win games if you don't have some sort of stabilizing force like a Kofi Coburn, where you, you're, you know, if you can walk on the floor and have an advantage every single time, that's great. And, and I think the thing with Kofi, and I mentioned it last night during the game, but his patience was off the charts. It just was. I mean, they, they were sending doubles at him and he just assessed the situation pass fake to alleviate some pressure spun out of it in you know in the correct moments and and I thought his touch was great last night you talk about 16 for 19 first of all I, I 
Dave Downey scoring having 22 field goals in one game is is insane. And it's fun. And it's looking at that that top six or whatever in Illinois history. I think the most recent one was 1969 or whatever it was. Right. Um, so it hasn't happened in a while. And part of that is, you know, a lot of teams they try to take those things away. But I always say with Kofi, if you're an opposing coach that's scouting for him, your best bet, your best bet is for some selfishness to creep in from the perimeter players, right? To take away from the advantage that they have every time down the court. And the thing with Kofi and the thing about his teammates specifically, and they deserve a ton of credit, they recognize it. They recognize it. And it sounds simple. I know everybody's sitting on their couch is saying, let's throw it into that guy every time. But everybody has their own motives. Every player wants to score, you know, 8, 10, 12, 14 points. And, you know, that's the sign of a really good team is when guys can simply put their own selfish tendencies, tendencies aside and say, hey, this is how we win this game going into this guy. And we're going to do it every time relentlessly. And that's where you look as an opposing coach and say, dang, when they're doing that and they're mixing in and, and you know, knocking down some outside shots as well, you know, they're able to hit seven threes last night it's a really tough team to beat, but he, you know, he really kind of stamped the national player of the year conversation last night against maybe the front runner. Um, and I know I'm sure that means a lot to him. He went, he went head to head with Zach Eady and Zach Eady got the best of him earlier in the year, but it's got to feel good. You know, if you're Kofi Coburn to have that moment of, Hey, you know, that's a legacy type of game. And it's, we talked about, we talked about it through the game. It's a national player of the year performance. And man, if he can continue to to be this confident and have this touch around the rim and patience, and then you bring Curbelo along, Robbie Hummel mentioned it on the, on the broadcast. There's no reason to not think of this team as a Final Four contender when they're doing all that. Yeah, I, I wrote it last night, Mike. Like it was the most points in a regular season Big Ten game since Brandon Paul had 42, and that's the game we remember about Brandon Paul's career. It's 42 against Ohio State. You might think of the Minnesota buzzer beater in, in the Big Ten tournament, but it was a legacy game. Like Gonzaga for him was a legacy game. This is one of those games you'll remember most about Kofi Coburn's career, just the, the sheer dominance of it. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that sentiment. Um, all right. Let's talk about Demonte Williams and Trent Frazier defensively um, what they're able to do. And I, I asked Brad Underwood uh, after the game. So I'll just pose it to you. Alfonso Plummer wasn't very strong defensively early on to put it lightly. Jacob Grandison struggled against Tyler wall. We know Kofi makes a huge impact defensively. But what is the impact of having two guys, Mike, that force usually the two other best guards, um, the opposing guards, into off nights? Like, what is the value of that? Well, there's a ton of value. And, and the, the particular moment in the game where it was like, hey, these are two all, you know, two all Big Ten type defenders. Demonte Williams is guarding Johnny Davis. And Johnny Davis comes off the ball screen. DeMonte, DeMonte Williams gets a little bit hung up on the ball screen, so Davis is able to get downhill. And who reaches in and swipes in and pokes the ball out? Trent Frazier. So the second you get past the first line of defense, you got to deal with another all-Big Ten type defender. And, and look, it, it covers up so much. Okay, you know, it wasn't Alfonso Plummer's strongest defensive, you know, outing yesterday. And, and there was a lot of getting beat baseline. And when you get beat, beat baseline, I talk about the, the rotating out of necessity – these guys, and there was a there was a pass down the court on a fast break to Stephen Crawl. He had a wide open lane. Trent Frazier runs from the weak side to to basically stop a wide open layup and knock it out of bounds. That type of stuff, and just their attentiveness defensively, their willingness every possession to get through screens. It, it just it sounds so trivial. And hey, they play hard and they get through screens, but not everyone does it. Right. Majority of people don't do it. Uh, for you know for possessions and you know they can they can people can string together two or three but the other thing that I'll mention you watch Luke Goody come in and play his butt off for four to five minutes that's great here's a guy that here are two guys that are doing it for 35 plus and and doing it against the the best players on the court national player of the year candidates and and you mentioned Jacob Grandison I know it wasn't his strongest game but I'll give him a ton of credit when we talk about bumping cutters and they said a ton of those flex screens they said a ton of those rip screens and Grandison was there every time checking Johnny Davis. And if you don't think that wears on a guy, you know, throughout the game, you're crazy. And it, it was just such a team effort defensively. But those two guys are, are you know, the heads of the snake, if you will. Um, and, and when you have those guys, 
your perimeter defense is always in a good spot. Okay, now it comes down to ball screen coverage and getting through those screens and then Kofi Coburn being selective with when he protects the rim. But this defense, you've, you've continued to see it, right? If, if they're right defensively, the offense is fine. I know there's been a snag the last couple of games, but with these two guys leading the charge defensively, you're going to win a ton of games. Yeah, and I mentioned Jacob Grant said Tower Wall had some of those, and I know a lot of that was help defense and things like that, but he only had two points, Wall, in the second half, and, and Grandison deserves a lot of credit for that. Uh, I want to bring up Grandison, but, Mike, this game kind of showed the two ways Illinois can win. Like, I think Purdue has to win by scoring points, right? And they're really good at it. And that's where Illinois' defense, when their third or fourth best options can really take advantage of Illinois' third or fourth defenders. Yeah. But uh, Indiana's got to win ugly. Illinois can kind of win both ways. And in this game, first half, they win, you know, pretty with, with the offense that was just rolling and uh, the ball movement was fantastic. And then the second half, uh, they locked down defensively. Um, so I, I think that's been a positive sign. They were able to win these ugly games. They're able to hang with Purdue for two overtimes without Kofi Coburn for most of it. Um, I, I think that shows those are the kind of teams that can, can go far in an NCAA tournament and, and win a lot of games in the Big Ten, of course. No question. And go back to the 2019-2020 season and trying to find their identity a little bit in the beginning of the season. And it got to the point early on in Big Ten play where it was just 50s and 60s. Let's just win these games. You know, let's just let's make it ugly. And that's how they won. You started to see last year a little bit. You add an Andre Corbello, DeMonte starts to unleash a little bit offensively. Trent starts to come along and, and continues to improve. Kobe gets a little more efficient offensively. And now you have a really good offense and you can win in the 70s and 80s. But you can also, you can do it both ways. And I think that's kind of what I worried about in the first half last night with this Wisconsin team is Wisconsin is, is you know, they're the kings of winning ugly. And with this team, they have a little more pace to them. They have a little more shake to them where if you don't sure things up defensively, Wisconsin can beat you in the 70s and 80s. They can do that. And, you know, I, I think this team, this Illinois team, as they, as they go into February, as they go into March, that's huge. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of teams across the country where it has to be a rock fight for them to have a chance of winning. And this, this Illinois team can win in the 50s. They can win track meets. They, you know, that, that is the type of versatility and, and credit Brad Underwood because although I think when he came here, it was like, we're going to run and gun. We're going to do all this. I mean, they're like 300th in the country in tempo. And part of that is trying to feed a big man every single time down. But part of that is just, hey, we're taking good shots. And if we take good shots and get them back on the offensive glass, we're going to have an efficient offense. So, yeah, you know, they've, they've proven that they're, they're ver winning games is great, but versatility in winning is even is even greater and, and they they have that and, and i think it's you're right it, it's gonna you know it's gonna pay dividends as you get close out the big 10 schedule and as you get closer to march all right mike i gotta bring up jacob grandison breaks out of the shooting slump for the previous five games in single digits was not shooting well i think the last seven games was 33 34 percent from the field under 30 percent from three uh gives you 14 points five and nine from the field three of six from three uh i just thought he got a shot in, made his first three, and just played completely differently. And it wasn't just offense, right? Like seven rebounds season high. That's what I want to see from Jacob Grandison. Yeah. Like he was so much better on the glass last year. And then he's so good at getting Kofi the ball. Like he's maybe him, Bossman's Verdonk, and of course, Curbelo uh, are, are probably the best post entry guys on, on this team. And all four of his assists were to Kofi last night. So there's four field goals right there out of the 16. Um, he said he just decided he was going to be out of the slump. Is that, is that what it is? Like, <laughs> how did you bust I, out of a slump? It sounds great, and I, and I think, you know, the whole mind control thing that that he said, you know, I, I get it. I think it, it comes a point in time where you start to recognize. I remember my my senior year at Wright State. I was I think I had a five for twenty seven stretch from three. I started off the year whatever fifty three fifty four percent, and was like. 30 it's probably similar to Grandison where I think I was 32 for 61 um so I was pretty well over 50 percent but you know there comes a point when you're in a slump where you know you realize you're slumping and it kind of gets in your head a little bit and then there's like whatever it is four five six games where you're like I mean I'm already slumping so I like I might as well just shoot it with confidence and yeah you're exactly right when the first one goes in and 
that's what I'm talking about with Wisconsin as well. They didn't see ones go in early. So it's hard to regain that, hard to get confidence. Even if you get open looks in transition, you still haven't seen a few go in. And now if you're 0 for 2, you miss this one, you're 0 for 3. Or if you're 1 for 4, now you're 1 for 5. And, you know, guys think about that. They do. And percentages. And um, it may sound selfish, but I think guys really want to do well. And if you're Jacob Grandison, you're still in the 40s. It's amazing to have a slump like he had, not to say that it was crazy, but he's still in the 40s. <laughs> he's still pretty comfortably in the 40s. So he, he has done a lot for this team. You know, you talk about 14 points, seven rebounds, four assists, two steals. I, I mentioned the three, you know, Grandison, Frazier, uh, and Williams, 16 assists, two turnovers. And, and he's part of that. And he is their best post-entry passer. Um, it's the reason why they have him in that horn set to come off and pop and, and throw those high lows from the middle third. You know, he, he, you've been able to shift him around and do a lot of things. I know he's in a tough spot because he constantly has to guard these Wisconsin and Ohio State and all, all these different four men in the league. But he's proven that, you know, the 34 minutes that he's playing, like he played last night, he's earned every ounce of those minutes. And that's saying a lot you know, after kind of how he started last year. So kudos to him. He's, he's kind of found his niche. And if you need 14 from him, great. But if you get three or four points from him, he's still doing other things on the floor. All right, Mike, uh, Andre Corbello comes back. And nice first half. Like, he had a few out-of-control moments. I just think you're going to have those with him where he has a couple of turnovers. Like, ah, you got to live with it. But he gives you seven points when Frazier and Plummer were not giving you much offense. Um, only played 12 minutes. I think Brad Underwood, he said afterwards, he, he didn't want to push him too hard. Um, but man, like it's weird to say this on a night where I think Underwood only played the bench for like eight minutes in the second half and all of the starters had 32 or 33 plus minutes. But to add Curbelo, uh just to, to the depth, right? Like you don't have to play RJ Melendez 15, 20 minutes like some fans want, but to know you have him, Goody, if Pajemski has to play, Payne and Bossman's have had some moments. You know, you're trying to get Hawkins back in here, but he seems to be the guy that's losing the most minutes. But all of a sudden, like you said it, like this team is full, and all of a sudden you got you got depth options that you can turn to. And I would imagine Curbelo at some point is going to be getting 20 minutes a game here, but um, you just see the glimpses of how easy it is for him to break down a defense. Yeah, and it was in a big moment, right? Last year, remember, it was everybody was clamoring for Capello to start because this Illinois team got off to such bad starts. It was like every game they were in a eight to two, nine nine to four hole, and then Capello came in and kind of set the table a little bit and always gave them that boost. And that's exactly what he's doing. Exactly what he did last night. It's ten to seven. He knocks down a three, right? Makes it ten ten, and then a couple of possessions later, he finishes around the rim. He has a big floater towards the end of the half. You know, he's making such a big impact. But I, let me say this about Andre Curbelo. For a kid that had the expectations that he had coming into the season, a lot of that's been derailed by, you know, concussion and, and COVID and all that. To come back and play 11 minutes in a game as a guy who is a third-team All-American preseason and accept that, that's, that's what is so impressive about Andre Curbelo is that he's about the team, right? They had a great rhythm. They had a great flow last night. And it's part of the reason why he only played whatever he played, three, probably three, four minutes in the second half. He's not pouting on the bench. He's cheering. He gets it. Like, he understands it. And, and I think that's what this Illinois culture has become. You know, there's no one that's greater than the team. Um, and, 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 you know, it seems easy, right? Oh, yeah, no, just, like, accept your role. But this is a kid with NBA aspirations. This is a kid with, you know, that had all these expectations coming into the season. And to just say, you know what, I know I'm coming back. I know it's been a, a rocky year, but I'm going to play my role. When I'm in there, I'm going to play hard. You saw him chase. He turned it over, didn't sulk, chased it down, stole the ball. Like that type of stuff are the things that you really value when it comes to Andre Corbelli. He does amazing things on the floor. There's no question about it. But what makes him really special and what I've been really impressed with is that team mentality, despite all the chips that have been stacked against him this year and all the stuff that he's gone through and how tumultuous it's been, he's just remained about the team. And you are crazy if you think that doesn't, you know, matriculate throughout the team, throughout the entire team. Now the next guy, now the, the freshman that isn't playing, I mean, what, like, what does he have to complain about, right? What does this guy that thinks he should play more minutes have to complain? Like you got a preseason third team All-American that's 
taking a back seat. I say taking a back seat, but playing 11 minutes and being okay with it because it's what's best for the team right now. Now they're going to, they're going to continue to integrate him a little bit. Um, but it says a lot about him that he, that he's not a problem. There's, there's plenty of guys around the country who would be a problem in that sense and fall into their own little silo. And, and man, I, I can't say enough about the kid. And I think that type of mentality, that stuff always comes back to you. And he's going to have a big moment here in late February. He's going to have a big moment in early March, NCAA tournament. It's going to happen because of the way that he's handled these, these last few months. Well said, Mike. Uh, from somebody who's lived that and, and lived in these locker rooms, I, I think that's uh, poignant for fans. All right, Mike, before we uh, wrap this up, two huge games. You're invading the state of Indiana here. At Indiana is always such a tough place to play. I know you and I talk about Assembly Hall and, and just what that atmosphere is like, how unique it is, how great it is in the Big Ten, uh, and then at Purdue. So by the next time we chat next week, boy, uh, Illinois could either – really affirm itself at the top of the Big Ten as a Big Ten title favorite now, not just a, a front runner, but probably is the favorite. Um, or they, they could split these games and you feel great. Um, or if you drop them all of a sudden, probably someone else is leading the Big Ten uh, heading into, uh, you know, the, the back half of the week. So what, what do you think of these two matchups for Illinois? It, well, it's, it's two of the tougher environments, like you mentioned in all the big 10. And, and I think if you can really, man, if you can go and win both of these, if you split it, you're probably, you know, you're fine. You're fine with that. Um, but if you can go in and win both these games on the road, I, it really does. You watch, look at the rest of that schedule where you go Northwestern Rutgers. I know you go Michigan state, Ohio state, and then Michigan again. Um, but this is going to set you up very nicely. And that Indiana team, look, you know, Trace Jackson Davis, is a big part of what they do, but you saw them knock off Purdue when Trace Jackson Davis was basically sit on the bench the whole game. And Rob Finnessy was a big part of that. And I know he's, I believe he's out now. Um, you know, so they, they are a little bit similar to last year. They have a little bit more offensive firepower, um, but they're still very stout defensively. And, and the way that they've kind of, you know, they've, they've done a really good job. Woodson's kind of integrated similarly to Archie Miller, where you just, we're going to shrink the floor, right? You're going to have, you're going to have to make shots on us. Like you're going to have to make threes and, you know, it may not be the same type of Kofi Coburn game that we saw against Wisconsin, but you're crazy to think he wouldn't have confidence going into that game. And you're crazy to think if you're Trace Jackson Davis and you saw how that Purdue game played out, I know he was sitting on the bench for most of it and they won the game, but he wants to go against Kofi Coburn and he probably doesn't want to get in foul trouble. So you attack that and you, and you try to exploit that. Look, I mean, I think this, you know, this Indiana team's 15th in the country, you know, per Ken Palm, uh, defensively and but offensively it, it's a little bit like last year where they've struggled a little bit they've shot it better from three because they have a couple more guys that can break guys down off the dribble but you know and, and then you talk about the Purdue game right you know that, that was potentially the game of the year uh earlier uh earlier this I guess last month in Champaign I think you're going to be setting up for about some, you know something similar in, in West Lafayette and that place is going to be rocking and that game, I know last night we talked about the Wisconsin game. Hey, if you're Illinois, you got to win this one because Wisconsin's schedule lightens up. This one here, if you can go 2-0 and here, you got to feel good heading into these last, you know, six, seven games. I know there's a couple more stout, you know, uh, people that you're playing, but, man, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited because these, these next, uh, whatever it is, like the next five days, six days of Illinois basketball is going to be – it's, we're going to look back in March and hopefully everyone will be like, man, this was, that was, that was part of the moment where you can go and steal those both on the road. And to think of the quad one wins you can get, like you could go from Mike five seed in brackets, bracketology to, to three, or maybe three. even on the two yeah. line, right? Like with, with three straight wins like this. So uh, that this is where Illinois, all the Illinois fans say, Oh, Illinois is ranked too low. Illinois uh, should be a higher seed this is the week to prove it, right? If, if you yep. take care of business here, uh, this is where you're going to get all of that national love. And all of a sudden national writers are going to be coming to Illinois games. So they'll, they'll be talking about your line. again. So this is the week to do it, but that's exciting, man. Uh, exciting it is. And I'll, I'll say this too, you know, you're ranked 18th in the country right now. You go and win this one in Indiana after knocking off Wisconsin, you're going to be sniffing the top 10. You're going to be, I, you know, they may move up to the, the 10 to 13 range and, what that sets up for, for Tuesday in, in West Lafayette, I'm excited, man.
Michael Tulip, you're the goods, man. Uh, we'll do a film review, breaking down that great victory of Wisconsin. So check that out on the VIP side of things. Always appreciate the time, man. Awesome, man. Thanks.